All right, we'll start. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and help. We thank you for this day you've given and for this hour now that we have to pursue your word. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is Bible Doctrine 3. The first unit was almost a year ago, it covered two quarters. The second unit covered the fall and winter quarters. We are now in the spring quarter of the Ashburn Baptist Bible Institute. Bible Doctrine 3, this unit of study covers the doctrine of the church and prophecy. And it will continue for two quarters, for the spring and the summer quarter, and the final examination in this third unit of Bible doctrine will be the last Wednesday in the month of August. Now, if you are following these classes online, it would help if you would give uh, an email to the church office and let us know so we'd have some idea of about how many are following these Bible Institute classes on Bible doctrine online, either the live streaming or the follow-up, picking it up later. Now, we just finished uh, on the doctrine of angels and salvation, had a test last week. You have your test back if you took that. Are there any questions off that test? Let's do that first. Any questions off that test? No, no questions. Uh, all right. <laughs> now then, we are on the doctrine of the church. Two weeks ago, in the prayer meeting, uh, we took a sampling of uh, answering the question, Answering the question, what is, what is a church? We got 52 responses from adults on this. And these are interesting. And since we're, we're launching into the doctrine of the church, let me read a couple of these and see what this, uh, what this sounds like. Here's one. A church is a body of believers who love each other, pray for each other, help each other, lift each other up also, gently guide each other in the right path if they fall or stray. What about this? Good, bad, strong, weak? What's your take? All right, it says nothing about organization. And a uh, body of believers who love each other. This could be uh, uh, an assembly of believers at a suburb Bible conference someplace. Uh, that uh, they love each other, pray for each other, help each other. Uh, it says... A church is not, you, you have to say, there has to be something about organization in it. Uh, let, let's uh, try another here. And uh, a place where people can gather to worship God. What is the problem with this? Yes. Yes, it's not a building, and 
uh, so we get off on The same is true of a school. The building is not school, though we often refer to this school and that school. The school is the faculty and, uh, and the students uh, and what goes on in there. And, and so then uh, here, here's another one. It is a place where people go to find God, serve God. Now, uh, these are not just people off the street, you know. These are uh, people from our church, a place where place where Christians can worship and learn about Jesus Christ. A church is a place. Uh, it is a place where you can come freely and fellowship with your fellow believers and so on. It is a place where a group of people can assemble and worship together. The church is the prayer house, uh, the God house. Well, God doesn't need housing, you know, this, uh, he, he does all right, a and, and so on. So, uh, uh, a place where, where uh, believers gather. So, there were about nine of these, I think, a place where people gather to worship, that uh, it, it tied with the building. And uh, the, the problem with this is, there were really not church buildings for about uh, till the time of Constantine in the fourth century. People met in other places or they met in, in homes. And uh, in China today, though there are church buildings, there are more people who meet in house churches than in church buildings. So that uh, if it's a building, we're, we're in trouble. Let, let me uh, try uh, another. A, ch a church is God's people praising him, learning the Bible, a way to love him and his people. Is there anything missing? They could be God's people of all different um, practices, I suppose. And doctrine, almost. Well, yes. Uh, it could be a youth rally at a civic auditorium, but not a church, not a church. Let's try another here. A fellowship with the Lord, the church is you, where we can join, hey, there, and lift each other up. Still, something's missing. What's, what's missing? Well, it, 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 it could be, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, here, an assembly of people who aim to be closer to God. Well, that could be the chapel at a Bible college. This is, and uh, not necessarily a church. Uh, and first, it's people. And it's a place to gather to worship our God, a place to fellowship, a place to learn the Word. Uh, Here's another, born again believers, gathering together for worship. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, this is not just a miscellaneous collection of believers. Born again believers gathering together for worship. This, this could apply to what? Born again believers gathering together for worship in answer to what is a church? A youth camp, maybe. What? A youth, a, a youth camp. Could be a ladies' retreat at a municipal auditorium. A birthday party. <laughs> a birthday party. Uh, and, uh, and so on. Now let's keep going here. It, here's one. It just says people. Well, uh, uh, 
a, a body of believers. This is interesting. This was the most of them like this. The body of Christ uh, is meeting believers for worship, instruction, fellowship, and evangelism. Uh, still, we're missing what here in this one? What are we missing? Organization. Organization, and what else? Baptism, Baptism we're missing. Uh, it, it is uh, <coughs> interesting, of course, that uh, this year, by the way, is a good year to pay a little attention to uh, church history because we come down to the last Sunday in October. It's the 500th year celebration of the Reformation. And the Lutherans came out of the Catholic framework in Europe and it, it all took place rather quickly uh, under Luther. So one Sunday, this building you go to is a Catholic building and a priest is in charge. The next Sunday you go, it's Lutheran. Nothing has changed about the building, by the way. Statuary and altar, the rest of it. Nothing has changed. Uh, the same man is up front. Now he is presumably a Lutheran minister. And some still called him priest, of course. And <clears throat> even down to modern time, the Lutheran ministers in Norway were called priests. Then came the reform. But all of this came out of Catholicism. And, of course, the emphasis was on the Word of God. The emphasis was on salvation by faith alone. And nevertheless, I often say to, that uh, Luther came out <clears throat> and left Catholicism behind. But he came out with a lot of mud on his boots. In other words, he... He dragged a lot of it with him and with the consequence that since that time the word church in general in the general public has almost lost its meaning and people simply do not know what what it is and that's evident by these that I've been reading here. Here's another one, the body of believers. Not a building, but the, me oh, members. Now that's good, that means some kind of organization. It's a family. Well, that's sentimental, that, that's, that's nice. Uh, and called out by God. But this is why you'll notice a body of believers gathering together to edify one another would share the gospel with the lost, a group of people gathering together to worship God and learning God's word, so on. This is why people who are born again can easily drift from one congregation to another and be totally oblivious as to any doctrinal difference of any kind. It just does not dawn on them. If they go someplace and they see some people with Bibles, well, that's good. They sing some songs that are familiar to them, well, that's good. They, that, that kind of clicks. And uh, they hear some familiar language well, then it must, it must be a church. And they're just totally clueless as to what a church really is. Uh, let, let's take a couple more. A body of believers bound together under Christ. And here is a church, is the bride of Christ, a body of Bible-believing people who believe savingly on Jesus as their personal Savior 
uh, the church is brought, bought by the blood of Christ. A group of believers uh, or a community of believers worshiping together and working together as one body in Christ, so on. So there's no difference. And then you get uh, on top of this general ignorance and interdenominationalism, which is uh, broad and does not make any distinctions. Chicago is blessed with the Moody Bible Institute, which along with its radio station is a powerful force. And however, you have to remember that the Moody Bible Institute is an interdenominational organization. Consequently, you're not going to get any teaching or much from there that defines what a church is uh, and would recognize broadly uh, various congregations as churches without any problem. Uh, last Saturday I'm listening and uh, one hour was spent with an Anglican priest discussing Lent. Anyone hear that program 12 noon? No, you were eating your lunch. Uh, and uh, no indication, of course, that this might not be a church. And uh, Lent, of course, is not mentioned in the Bible any place. This is out of medieval Catholicism. And uh, that's what you get with, uh, with interdenominationalism. A church is a family of believers, a spiritually unified group of people who come together to praise, worship, and serve God as believers in Jesus Christ. And on it goes, a body of believers. Uh, the, the bulk of these, the, 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 a few, about nine, centered on the building. The bulk of them oh, were similar to what I've been reading. And then there were some that were on target. For instance, a church is a body of baptized believers that gather to worship and serve the Lord. Uh, could add a little more, but it's at least moving in the right direction. So there, there is obviously... Uh, disagreement, confusion, uh, ignorance, and in abundance on what this is all about. Now, uh, the Reformed and Lutheran and Reformed definition of, of a church is where the Word of God is preached and the, quote, sacraments rightly or properly administered. So there's sacraments. That's the Catholic part of it, uh, weighing in heavily on the whole thing. Well, first of all, we're, we're going to have to, to get down. Uh, there's some verses to learn. You're going to need one of these outlines, and you're, we're working from it, so who does not have this? All right. Uh, you have, no, everybody else has one of these. Okay. All right. We're, yeah, I have a question. What? I have a question. Okay, a question. You have one of these. Uh, yes, question. I'm reading the other day. Talks about the, the brother sins against you and says bring it before the church, but technically there is no church yet. <laughs> All right, it's a good, good question, and it raises a point: When does the church start? So let let's take that up right now. 
the answer you're going to hear almost from anyone, everyone, and anywhere is the church started on the day of Pentecost. This, this, this is what you hear. Now open your Bible with me to Acts. Uh, Acts 2, of course, is the day of, of Pentecost. So I have some questions. You had a question, I have some questions. If the church started on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verse 15, who are these 120 who are meeting in the upper room? <laughs> and what on earth does it mean in Acts chapter 2? Two, when these 3,000 got converted on the day of Pentecost, verse 41, who received his word, were baptized, and underlined, were added. Added to what? Added to what? The 3,000 were added to what? The church. The, the 120 that were there already prior to Pentecost. So now let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Jesus is squeezing out of the disciples who he is. And uh, verse 16. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, 17, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood is not revealed to you, but my father, I, you, who are Peter. And I, upon this rock, the statement of Peter on Christ himself, I will build my church. This is going on in the Gospels. Uh, I would dare say you go to chapter 10 of Matthew and you have a, a membership list of the church getting started. Simon, which is called Peter, verse 2, Andrew, James, Philip, Matthew, Thomas, so on. You have a membership list. So... The church is starting, Christ is building it in the Gospels. Now, before Pentecost, you have both ordinances. All these people here, Matthew 10, they're all what? Baptized. And before the crucifixion, you have the Lord's Supper, so before you get out of the Gospels, you have Christ building the church. You have people being baptized. And you have the Lord's Supper inaugurated in Matthew 26. So all of that is pre-Pentecost. Pre and yet people keep saying the church started on the day of Pentecost. That got a big bump forward, there's no, no, no denying that. But you've got uh, the churches there already, and those 3,000 are added to it. And this is part of the confusion about the church that uh, is, is very widespread. And this, the church started on the day of Pentecost. That is basically a a misleading statement that comes out of the old Schofield Bible notes and dispensationalism that uh, er everything is very cut and dried with the seven dispensations. Now, obviously, I'm, let's touch that briefly. I'm a dispensationalist. You have an old covenant, an old testament. You have a new testament. So you, you have two there. And you have the millennium coming. There's, there's a third, 
Now, seven uh, might be uh, something else. But uh, I'm taking the position, and you can think about it, that we do not move from the old to the new dispensation at midnight on some particular night. It moves slower than that and is a process. Uh, obviously, John the Baptist is a transitional person. He's like an Old Testament prophet, yet he's the first prophet in the New Testament. And so the church is being assembled during the life of Christ. And so you're, you're moving. And they're still wrestling with this in Acts chapter 15. The, Acts chapter 15, the question is, is are Christian believers just a Jewish subsect of some kind, or is this something new and distinct? Well, we find that it is something, something new, something different. You have the Jews, the Gentiles, Paul says in Corinthians, and the church of God. So that uh, the Christians, or oh, all the early Christians were Jews, and uh, this is the Paul-Peter debate and the whole thing that was settled in Acts chapter 15 that they wrestled through, that you could become a Christian without first being a Jew. Ah, you did not have to be circumcised. You did not have to keep the festivals. You could come directly from paganism into a Christian church and you did not have to pass through the other. Well, we need to, to get into the book, into the outline and take care of the verses. So we're on page 43. You're with me? Page 43. And here are the texts for the next, for this entire, we're going to do this entire unit, which runs through two quarters, uh, the spring quarter and the summer quarter. Then comes the exam at the end of August. So we're on page 43, and we're down, uh, under definition, under A2, Matthew 16, 18, underline. 1618. Ephesians 525, right below it. Ephesians 527, right below it. And those are the only three on that page, the Matthew and the two Ephesians. We're on page 44 now. And we're down to B under membership. And you're underlining Acts 2.38 and then 41 and 42. Uh, the key to the whole thing is in verses 41 and 42. Here it is. That's what a church is. Seven points. Then we're on page 45. Right at the top, Psalm 122.1. Right below it, Hebrews 10.25. Down under 3, Acts 5.42. Then under 4, 1 John 3.17. Then we're under Roman numeral 3, Discipline B, Galatians 6.1. Down a couple lines right below that, Matthew 18, 15. That's the one you were asking about, you know, the church discipline. Not only do you have baptism prior to Pentecost, you have the Lord's Supper prior to Pentecost, and you have church discipline laid down. 
And then a couple of lines below that, Matthew 18, 16. And below that, Matthew 18, 17, A. And the last line, Matthew 18, 17, B. We're together. We're at page 46. And we're at the top. Second line, Matthew 18, 18. Right below that, 1 Corinthians 5, 4. Then under number 3, 1 Corinthians 5, 13. Under E, 9. Romans 16, 17. Under 10, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. We're on page 47. Under G2, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 40. Under 5, it's Titus 3, 10. And then we're under, well, that's it for that page. And uh, now we're on page 48, and we're under D, the, toward the bottom of the page. D1, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Straight below that, under 3. Acts 15, 28. Under 4, Acts 15, 22. Then, under officers there, Philippians 1, 1. And we're on page 49. And it's the third line, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1. And now... There is nothing on page 50. And we are on page 51. And uh, under 4, 1 Timothy A, 1 Timothy 5, 17. Right below that, Hebrews 13, 17. Right below that, 1 Timothy 5, 18. Couple lines down, 1 Timothy 5, 19 under D. Then under B, number 1A, Acts 6, 3. And second line up from the bottom, 1 Timothy 3, 8. And uh, nothing on page 52. We're on page 53. Under B2, Mark 16, 16. And then at the very bottom of the page, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Or on page 54, D, D, Ephesians 4, 5, then under 3, C, Acts 10, 48. Now we're down to B, 2, and under A, 1, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and a couple lines below that, 1 Corinthians 11, 25. And on page 55, there's only one passage under A, uh, toward the bottom, A3, Malachi 3, 8 to 10. And then we're on page 56, under 3, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And under 8, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 
We're on page 57. We're into prophecy now. Under Roman numeral 1a, Isaiah 59, 2. And then we're Roman numeral 2a, number 1, Luke 16, 23. Next line, Luke 23, 43. Right after that, Philippians 1, 23. Then 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And we are on page 58. And it is number uh, Roman 3, B, 2, Acts 1, 11. And under 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, 16, and 17. Right below that, Revelation 1, 7. Two lines down. John 14, 3, next line, Acts 1, 11. Next line, Matthew 24, 27. Two line, next line down, Matthew 24, 30. And then under D1, Matthew 25, 13. And over on page 59, E1, Titus 2, 12 and 13. And under A, John 14, A4, John 14, 19. And at the very bottom, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Are you with me? Apparently, I hear no outbursts here. And we are on page 60, uh, under number 6, Philippians 3, 21. Then under Roman numeral 5, A, the small b, Hebrews 9, 27. Under 2, 2 Timothy 4, 1. Over on page 61, C, Hebrews 10, 27. Next line, 2 Thessalonians 7, number, chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. And B, uh, number one, Romans 14, 10, and 12. Well, we're getting there. Page 62, under B toward the top, Matthew 10, 28. Then under 2B, Revelation 20, 14, and 15. Under J, Luke 16, 24. Then two lines down, Psalm 9, 17. Right after it, Revelation 21, 8. Next line, Revelation 20, 10. Revelation's on one line, the 20, 10 on the next. And then page 63. We're under B, uh, Revelation 21, 27. Under 3B, 1 John 3, 2. Under 3D, Revelation 21, 4. So that will keep you out of mischief <laughs> for, for a little while anyway. Yes. You, you got lost on page 52. Well, I'm glad you know what page it is. 52. 62. 62. All right. Luke 16, 24 is the last one I got. Luke 16, 24. Okay, drop down two lines. Psalm 9, 17. Revelation 21, 8. And then Revelation 20, 10. 2010, okay? How are we doing? All right. So what we're, we're going to do when we come together, th this, uh, a, a subset 
of church history is the history of doctrine. At certain times uh, through the centuries, certain doctrines have been up for uh, debate, uh, refinement, sometimes expression in creeds, and so on. One of the <clears throat> early debates was, uh, who is Jesus? Is he God? Is he man? How does all this work out? And you ended up with the Nicene, the Nicene Creed. Then to hit the high points, you come down to the Reformation, the big discussion was uh, the place of the Word of God over against tradition and uh, are the scriptures in supreme authority or is the <coughs> church? The reformers said the scriptures, the Catholics said the church. So you had certain of these things. A generation ago in American evangelicalism, a lot of attention was given to prophecy. Uh, 1900s, 1920s, 1930s even, there were great con prophetic conferences. People got very interested in prophecy, so on. The, the issue now in our time, uh, if we're charting out the history of doctrine, is the doctrine of the church. In other words, just what is meant by church? What is a church? And you find all kinds of different viewpoints on this and, and ideas. You hear a lot of the, the phrase, the body of Christ uh, is, is prominent. And sometimes even you ask a person, oh, you're a believer. Oh, yeah, I got saved, you know, five years ago, whatever it was. And so what church do you belong to? Well, I belong to the body of Christ. Well, just what is this? And where is this? And where does this assemble? Uh, there are questions. So obviously, this study should be interesting and fascinating, and you have friends who go here or there or no place. It's good conversation to, to kick around and, and challenge. Now, for next week, uh, look up everything. We're on page 40, 43. So pretty well take under definition, everything under definition. We're going to work on definition next week and uh, should have pretty well clearly in mind what a church is by the time we end up with that. I think significantly most, most people, it's just sort of a, a foggy area with them. They have very little concept of what it's all about. And therefore, anything and everything is, quote, a church. All right, we've got it. Let's pray. Our Father, we look to you. We thank you for these moments. And as we enter now this course of study, we pray that you'll give us diligence. As you, we know you would not have given your word without also the expectation that we would read it, study it, and grasp its truth. Help us to do that, and then not to be selfish, but to share what we learn with others for their blessing and growth. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>